my knee, your knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And now we can worship that Lord. Would you stand? Would you greet those around you? Welcome them to worship. We're glad you're here. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Please be seated. Thank you, choir. It's my joy to welcome you to worship today. Our pastor, Don Davidson, and his wife, Audrey, are at a Guidestone meeting. You can see the information there that's actually in the insert in your order of service. He's a trustee on the Guidestone uh, board, and they're meeting in Nashville, so he's attending First Baptist Nashville this morning along with his team. So we'll be praying for them uh, today. And uh, in his stead, though, Joel Harder is going to be bringing in our message, and you're in for a real treat uh, today. And uh, Joel's just back from a mission trip to Central Asia, and God did a mighty work in his heart, in his life, in his body, uh, in his whole team. And uh, he shares a lot of that in this message today, and I know that God will speak to you in a great way. If you're our guest today, please take a communication card from the pew rack in front of you and place it in the offering plate. You know, I just thought of something, though, today. There's a lot of things happening. We're kind of in the summertime. People are moving back and forth from one place to another. And uh, today is the last Sunday for someone very special, uh, Carol and Pat Bruton. Would you all stand? Where are you? Uh, they're in the very back back there. In the, look in the back. Pat and Carol, they're retiring and moving back to Georgia. So let's appreciate Pat for her ministry to our church. Thank you, Pat. I know you didn't know I was going to do that, and uh, ordinarily I would have thought to maybe at the end of the service, but I might have forgotten. I did not want to uh, pass that up, and you've been here more than 10 years uh, here at First Baptist Church, and we thank you for your ministry in the senior pastor's office. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be the church, the church family, to rejoice with those that are rejoicing, to weep with those that are weeping to encourage those that need to be encouraged, to receive encouragement when we need it as well. We thank you for that family atmosphere that this church has. I pray you'll bless us today as we listen carefully to what you have to say to us because we will never be the same because of your presence here today. It's a special time, any time we can be in your presence, Lord. So we honor you and we worship you with that. Bless Joel as he brings the message. Bless us as we lift our songs to you, Lord, from our hearts today and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Right. 
Thank you, Stacy and choir, for a wonderful old song done in a little bit of a new way. What a ministry that song is to my heart. Let's stand together. Let's continue to worship.
seated. Thank you. Well, good morning. How's everybody morning. doing today? Doing well? It's summer. It's not as hot as it is where I'm from, and for that I rejoice. Uh, if you would, go ahead and turn in your Bible to the first chapter of Philippians. I'm from Texas, by the way. Uh, go ahead and turn in uh, your Bible to the first chapter of Philippians. That's where we're going to be uh, this morning. Uh, if you do not have a Bible, you can go ahead and pull one of those blue Purack Bibles in front of you. Page 1161 is the first chapter of Philippians, and that's where we're going to be. As you turn there, let me go ahead and just introduce myself to you if uh, you're not uh, familiar with who I am. My name is Joel Harder. I'm the pastor for discipleship and missions here at First Baptist. And uh, for about six years, I've been serving as the pastor for single adults and young adults. And then uh, over the last year, we've had some staff changes. And just recently, I have shifted into this newly combined role of uh, discipleship and missions. And we've added Reed Burnick to our staff as pastor for young adults and uh, Reed is not with us uh, this morning. He's at his home church in uh, Norfolk where he's being ordained. So we're praying for him this morning as he is uh, there and excited to have him on our, on our team here. Uh, you should have uh, pulled up Philippians to uh, the first chapter, and you'll see uh, right there in verse 5 the phrase partnership in the gospel. And that's, uh, that's the title of my sermon, partnership in the gospel. And before we jump into this sermon this morning, I want you to do something a little different. If you would, just take your order of worship. There's some place for notes. Take a pen or a pencil, and I want you to jot down some ideas, some phrases, maybe, maybe a definition, but what does the word partnership mean? mean to you? Maybe write down a, a definition of partnership or just some ideas, phrases. Just think about that word. What does partnership mean? Uh, as you're thinking about that word and doing some of that uh, writing and, and processing, let me give you a little background about this letter. It's the letter from Apostle Paul, and Pastor Don has been leading us through the Apostle's letter all summer. It's my privilege to take up a portion of this text with you, and I recognize that Pastor Don recently preached on this passage, but I believe God's impressed upon my heart a word for us this morning, and I don't believe you'll find it repetitive, but we'll build on the foundation that Don has laid. Philippians is one of the pastoral epistles. It's one where we really see the pastor's heart shine in Paul. Uh, it's often re referred to as the letter of joy, and joy is a major theme throughout the entire text. It's such a dominant theme of the letter that Pastor Don's even entitled our study this summer as the summer of joy here at First Baptist. It's strange and even a bit counterintuitive to uh, consider how much joy just drips from this letter when we consider the circumstances under which it was written. Philippians is one of the prison epistles. It's perhaps the first of the prison epistles. Paul was literally in chains while writing this correspondence to the church in Philippi. And it's clear from his writings that he perceived himself to be other under a death sentence. And he kind of debates with himself about whether or not he's actually going to die uh, today or tomorrow. But it becomes very clear that he, he, he genuinely believes that the day he's writing this letter could be his last. And yet he's overcome with great joy an all surpassing joy. His heart overflows with compassion for his beloved brothers and sisters when he thinks about his church back in Philippi. He calls them his partners in the gospel, and he longed to tell them how happy he was to know that their commitment to the gospel had continued. And it continued despite great trial. Many were being persecuted. There were a lot of setbacks along the way. Paul himself was under arrest. There was great disruption and confusion. There were these uh, insincere teachers that had followed along behind Paul and were preaching out of questionable motives. And the church there at Philippi wasn't quite, they weren't quite sure what to make of that. But there was great need. 
both spiritually and materially, for the church in Philippi to engage in the advancement of the gospel. And this was an enormous undertaking. You see, Paul had a bold and ambitious strategy to take the gospel into all of Asia Minor. Everywhere Paul planted a church along the way, he did so with what Tom Constable refers to as the eye of a strategist. Every church, every community of faith was was planted to be part of a strategic, cohesive vision, a strategy to penetrate that continent with the good news that Jesus Christ is alive. Paul's need for help in this effort was enormous, and it was far more than any one church could take on by itself. And yet, here they were, his faithful partners in Philippi. And how did they rise to meet that need? Well, we read in the letter a few different ways. First, we read of the people. Lydia, who was an expert tradeswoman and church leader in Philippi, who had turned her business into a source of revenue to support the missionary efforts of Paul and his comrades. We read about Clement, who the ancients uh, believe was a personal disciple of Paul and later became one of the church leaders in Rome. We read about uh, the prayer support that they provided. Paul mentions how it was through the prayers of the church in Philippi and the power of the Holy Spirit that his deliverance was coming. We read about provision. Paul mentions how the church provided financial gifts and resources, but they gave something so much more. They, they gave one of their own, Epaphroditus, who uh, left from their church to go and aid and serve and, and support Paul in his missionary journey at great personal cost. And as we read this letter, Paul is sending Epaphroditus back to his beloved home church. In every way, the believers in Philippi, this, this band of believers there, were in it all the way with Paul. They were in it together. They celebrated victories together, and they walked through setbacks and spiritual attacks and hardships together. Something extraordinary happens when a group of people experience this sort of partnership, this sort of community, this sort of church. And it doesn't happen by accident, but through the mysterious power of God and almost always through suffering together, walking through the fires of life together, a joyous bond is formed. It's the mystery of the joy in the face of every circumstance that this letter is all about. Great works of art and literature have tried to capture this joyous bond. One of my favorites is Shakespeare's Henry V, the St. Crispin's Day speech when the uh, uh, weary warriors are preparing to fight their last fight to die for one another. And the king speaks, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. And that, of course, became the title of Stephen Ambrose's great book that became a miniseries about the 101 Airborne uh, Fighting Parachute Company, Easy Company, and uh, the Band of Brothers miniseries you've probably seen, uh, the horrific and heroic battles they fought in World War II. But it doesn't, it doesn't just take the extreme of war or life and death situations for this joyous bond to be forged. As we look throughout scripture and throughout church history, we see it time and time again. The the people of of Jesus, the church, being bonded in joy. And it almost always seems to require three things. First, a, a total commitment to Christ by each individual. Every individual in the church committed totally to Christ. Secondly, a selflessness to care more for those around you than for yourself. And finally, it seems to always require shared suffering. Walking through a fire of some kind together. Now, you may be sitting there right now thinking about those people that you've walked through the fires of life with. Maybe you're sitting next to them right now. They're people in this church, or maybe you're thinking about those people from a previous church or a previous small group, and, and you know what I'm talking about. You, you know the bond of commitment that they have for you and you have for them. And as a pastor, I desire so much that you discover this joyous bond in church. 
And I believe that you desire that as well because it's often one of the very first questions that I get asked or Roger gets asked or, or Kim or Michael. When people come to First Baptist and say, how do I get connected here? How do I really get connected to the church here? And I've often said, if you want to know church like that, if you want to know fellowship like that, community like that, then go on a mission trip. Nothing, nothing will unite you to others in our church like serving on a team, typically in, in difficult situations. And I've said that long before I ever became a missions pastor. Uh, I, I say it because it's true. I say it because I've experienced it time and time again. I know what fellowship within the church, like that which we read about in Philippians, is like. And I just experienced it again. Just recently, I was on mission with brothers and sisters traveling to the other side of the world. We gave of our time, our resources. We stepped away from our families and our personal security to serve together. And, and why did we do it? We did it for the gospel. Two weeks ago, we went to serve the men and women and their families who have made such great sacrifices. They've uprooted their whole lives and transplanted their families away from their homes here in the U.S. to live among a people and in a place where the gospel is not known. And our task, our mission was to fellowship with them, to encourage and support them in every way that we could, just as the church in Philippi did for Paul. And we came back with a joyous bond that proclaims to me and to you that the message of Philippians is just as real and just as relevant to the church today as it was when Paul wrote it. The, my message to you out of Philippians this morning is this. There is, in fact, still a holy partnership that is available to every believer in Christ Jesus. And this partnership is defined by the person and work of Jesus. But if we are to participate in this partnership, it will require three things of us. It will require a commitment to the advancement of the gospel, being open to where the Spirit of God is going and the courage to trust God as we go. So let's take up Philippians chapter 1. Just look in the first few verses with me. Paul and Timothy, a servant of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Now notice, notice right there that as Paul begins to address the church, he specifically calls out the leadership and the structure of the church. He, he doesn't just have the individuals in his mind. I mean, he does, and he's going to call them out name by name. But he has the whole organization of the church. He talks about the leadership, the overseers, and the deacons. He is, it's the whole idea of the church that brings a smile to this old imprisoned pastor when he writes to them. He's overcome with joy when he considers the beauty and the design of godly leaders and overseers along with deacons who are serving to meet the needs of the church. There is a heavenly design when, when the people of God submit to godly leadership and godly leadership serves sacrificially those who are entrusted to them. Six years ago, I rediscovered God's call on my life to pastor in the local church when he reminded me that the church is God's appointed method to redeem the world. This is the institution that Jesus established as his body on earth. If we would begin to grasp this design of submission and sacrificial service to one another, we would understand what Jesus is talking about when he tells us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is talking about the church. Kingdom coming on earth is the church. This happens in the church when we submit to authority and serve sacrificially and love without prejudice. Then the gospel cannot help but go forth and the kingdom of heaven comes to earth. But that's not, that's not really our experience in the church, is it? I mean, not fully. And why? Well, Paul's going to be explicitly clear just one chapter over we, we read these words. Roger opened our time of worship with that video. This only works, Paul says, if we put aside selfish ambition and vain conceit. 
If we stop trying to make the church look the way we think it ought to look and selflessly look to the needs of others as better than ourselves. Paul says the key to kingdom coming, the key to church Jesus' way, the key to joy in all circumstances is this. Chapter 2, verse 5. Have the mind of Christ, who in his very nature was God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but humbled himself and took on, took on the person of a servant, humbled himself to even death on a cross. And Paul's letter to the Philippian church is, is him cheering them on because they're getting it. Sure, they're not perfect and he needs to correct them along the way, but they're getting it. So let's, let's read on. In Paul's letter, he says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all. I make my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Well, what does that word mean to you? You've written some things down on your worship guide. To partner. To be in partnership. When our team of 26 were gathered in Central Asia, we were studying this verse. And we asked that question. And we, we talked about different things. Maybe you've written down some of the same phrases that, uh, that we came up with. A joint venture. Shared responsibility. Working together to accomplish a goal or a vision or a strategic plan. But what if I told you that the word for partnership right there that Paul uses in the Greek is the word koinonia. It's the word that we most often translate as fellowship. We first read it in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 when the disciples devote themselves to the apostles teaching and to the communion together. The fellowship. We think of koinonia in relational terms and sharing with one another and meeting each other's need and having community together. Not, not quite the same way we think of partnership. The spirit of the word partnership is very different than the spirit of the word fellowship. So what makes this koinonia, what makes this fellowship so unique that we would translate it as partnership? Well, for that answer, I, I think we just have to look at the text. Notice in verse 5 right there, it says, for your partnership or fellowship in the gospel. This is fellowship in the gospel. And gospel can mean a, a number of things in Scripture. It could mean a, a specific doctrine or system of belief. It could mean the actual proclamation of the good news, Jesus is alive. But in, in Philippians, gospel most accurately means the person and work of Jesus Christ. And how do I know that? Look at chapter 2. We already alluded to it. We started our service this way. Paul gives us Jesus' resume who he is, and what he's done. So gospel is the person and work of Jesus. So I just want to make three quick observations. What makes this fellowship in the gospel so unique? First, fellowship in the gospel is a common banner. In chapter 2, Paul gives us Christ's resume. In chapter 3, Paul gives us his own resume. He says that, you know, look at me. I, I, here I am. I'm, I'm a, a Jew among Jews, according to uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews, according to the tri people of Israel, a tribe of Benjamin, according to the law of, of Pharisee, as to zeal, persecutor of the church. He gives his own resume and who he is and what defined him on this earth. But in the gospel, once we become Christians, we become uh, a, a part of a different people. Our allegiance is to a new banner. Now, we do not cease to be of the tribe or tongue that we're from. We don't abandon our heritage. Africans are still Africans. Vietnamese are still Vietnamese. Bulgarians are still Bulgarians. And yes, Texans are still Texans. We don't cease to be of the tribe and tongue that we are from, but we take on a greater citizenship of a higher kingdom that transcends earthly borders. And when we fellowship in the gospel, when we become part of this common banner, something wonderful happens. We, we develop a passion for the nations, a, a love for all people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Fellowship in the gospel is about taking on a common banner. Secondly, fellowship in the gospel is sanctifying. Notice in verse 6, what is Paul confident of? He's confident that the work God began will be completed. And what is that work? It's the work of salvation. More specifically, the work of sanctification. Fellowship in the gospel is fellowship that makes us holy. These are the people whose influence in your life and interest in your life is about you becoming like Jesus. Too quickly we become distracted in our fellowship with one another. We desire to gather maybe just with people we like or people who like us or who have similar interests. And we often choose to avoid the people we don't as easily relate to. But listen, when we experience fellowship with other people and it's not focused on our sanctification, it it can still be good. It can still be fun, and it can still serve constructive purposes, but it's only when our fellowship is focused on becoming like Jesus that we're fellowshipping in the gospel. Learning to love people who aren't the easiest to love is the greatest gift God gives us in the church. So fellowship in the gospel is sanctifying. And finally, fellowship in the gospel desires that the gospel go forth. There is cultivated in us a love for the lost. Those who are not in the fellowship of the gospel, a longing for them to be saved. Notice throughout this letter, Paul keeps mentioning people who are not saved and how much he desires them to be saved. In verse 18 of chapter 1, he says, What does it matter if these teachers come behind me with impure motives and, and, and different agendas so long as the gospel is proclaimed and people become saved? He even talks about his persecutors. He he says his imprisonment, his jailers, the palace guard, they've come to faith. There is a love for all people to hear the gospel and become saved. Fellowship in the gospel is a love for the lost. And when we... When we were with those missionaries in Central Asia, when we fellowshiped together, we walked away as partners. Because together with them, we can intentionally work to see the gospel go into the dark places of the world. The places that need it most. When Pastor Don preached on this text a few weeks ago, he he said this to us. So we have these partners. Now we have to keep in touch. In the remaining few minutes that I have, I just want to share with you what our partners in the gospel overseas shared with us. And as Pastor Don exhorted us to, we believe we need to keep in touch with them and we need to deepen our partnership. A few days before that conference ended, I I left with a small team of five and we left Central Asia and we went over to Eastern Europe on a vision trip to see what God is doing through our partners there. The purpose of the trip was to see how God might be calling us to a, a new Uh, global strategy. Specifically, I want to tell you about a man named Nikolai. Nikolai is an older man, and he's actually trying to pull back on some of his leadership roles. You see, under the Soviet Union, Nikolai was responsible for illegally planting multiple evangelical churches, illegally leading many to Christ and discipling them, and illegally he started the only evangelical seminary training underground pastors in that part of Europe. Today, he's traveling to parts of the Middle East that we as Americans simply cannot go and discipling new believers there. And we met him for breakfast, and, uh, and he told us about the state of the gospel and how it was advancing in that region. And we asked him, Nikolai, what would it look like for a church like ours in America to come alongside you, to partner with you, to get involved? What would, what would be most helpful? And now I want to remind you that we as a team had just spent four days studying this passage of Philippians. And Nikolai looks at me and he responds like this, Joel, are you familiar with Philippians 1.5? It was like the air became electrified. The hair stood up on the back of our necks. An audible voice from heaven rang out, and God speaks with an Eastern European accent. I I walked out of that uh, meeting and talked to Jamie and Luke, and I said, I just wish God would be a little more clear with us when he's trying to tell us where he wants us to go. So I have to search out his will. Well, Nikolai said that there are three things 
that this holy partnership found in Philippians 1.5 will require. And I want you to listen to these three things because they're the application points of my sermon. Whether on the other side of the world or the other side of the street, these three things are how you as a believer can be part of a holy partnership in the gospel that will produce immeasurable joy throughout your entire life. First, commitment to see the gospel advance. You see, we must desire above all else that the gospel goes forth. We saw in every little mountain village we visited, every pastor we spoke to, an evangelist, a longing for the indigenous, largely Muslim population to hear the gospel and become saved. And the same opportunity exists for us here in Alexandria. We must ask God to cultivate a compassion for the lost and a longing for them to be saved, however that might look. And how can we do that? Well, first, when you leave this place and you go to your Bible fellowship or your small group or your prayer group or your life group, talk about the lost people in your life and pray for them. Be intentional about praying for the lost in your life. Second, ask God to change your heart. Let's be honest. It's not in our nature to love all people. God is going to have to change our hearts. And often the reason why he hasn't changed our hearts is because we haven't asked him to. Listen, I think so often in our teaching and sermonizing, we, we try to make application points that are, uh, that, that are just a, a list of things to go and do. But sometimes the application is not a list of something to go and do, but it's to be transformed. It's to go and be something. When Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, he said, go and sin no more. But only after he said, your sins are forgiven. He changed her heart first. He changed her spiritual status. We have to ask God to change our hearts to be the kind of people who love the lost of all nations and long for them to be saved. Secondly, Nikolai told us that this partnership will require an openness to where God is moving. And this is all about a spiritual self-awareness that the patterns of this world just try to beat out of us. And it, it creeps up on us slowly as we put blinders on and, uh, and, and box God in to where we'll allow him to be moving. And there's, there's nothing malicious in it. It's most often that we just saw where God was moving and had wonderful experiences partnering with him there. And over time, we become so comfortable to, to that way of working with God that that's the only way we believe that he can work. That's how he does it. That's the method he uses. But, but listen, we can't do that. The gospel is like a rushing river. Isaiah likens the Holy Spirit to a river and the gospel is like rushing water that flows downstream into every void that it can fill. And so we have to pause and we have to reflect and we have to ask God to tell us what doors are opening to the gospel now. And this is what Sabbath is all about. It's a day to pause and reflect and consider the work we've done and what is good. What doors are closing what doors are opening. So today after church, take some time to pause, reflect, ask God to show you what doors are opening. Is, is there a new opportunity to pray for the lost in your life, to share your testimony, to show the love of Jesus and a small gesture of kindness or compassion? As a vision team in Eastern Europe, this was our entire goal. It was to be open to where God was moving and this is not the time or place for me to tell you all that God showed us, but I will tell you this. There is a wide open door for the gospel to go back into Asia through this part of the world. We saw the fields ripe for harvest and God's people working them. We saw incredible opportunity for the gospel to go forth and it left us in awe. And this vision that we see for the gospel to advance is just as bold and just as ambitious as what Paul was calling the church in Philippi to be part of. And I want to quickly just tell you, everybody we talked to in Eastern Europe, not one of them asked for financial support. They simply asked us to affirm that what they saw is the same thing we were seeing. 
the opportunity for the gospel and if we would begin by praying for them. So partnership requires an openness to where God is moving. Then finally, Nikolai told us that partnership would require courage. And when he told us that, that one word is all he said. We didn't really think much more of it. Courage is, is, is thrown around so easily and lightly in our culture. But we learned two days later what he meant when he said courage. Many of you have heard about the accident, and so many of you have prayed for us. I'm overjoyed to tell you that we all came home and we are all healing. And we know that your prayers are part of the reason for that. I debated showing you a picture of the accident this morning, but I've decided not to. It's helpful for you to see it so that you understand that I'm not being sensational or dramatic or I'm not seeing this outside of its proper proportion. But I want to simply tell you this. We all should have died that day. Each and every one of us in that van have a different perspective and vantage point on what happened, how it happened. But we are all of one mind and we know unquestionably why it happened. We believe that God showed us as a team that his spirit is seeking to take the gospel back into a part of the world that is dark and where the gospel is most suppressed. We saw what God wanted us to see and the spiritual forces and principalities of darkness sought to keep us from coming back and telling you about it. Pastor Don wrote a wonderful journal article this week and I encourage you to go to the website and read it. He says we need to be careful about the language we use, specifically the language of spiritual warfare. It's so often misunderstood and it can lead people to miss hearing the gospel and that's tragic and we ought to be careful when using that language but it is the language the Bible uses. When Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6 that our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the dark forces and principalities of darkness in the heavenly realms, I get that now. We were not engaged in a fight with other people. We were in a car accident. Spiritual warfare ought never cause us to fear or to hate other people. Remember, partnership in the gospel is all about loving all people. And we have absolutely no ill will toward our driver, but we believe he was under spiritual assault and that led him to lose control of the van. He is grieved in his spirit and deeply ashamed and we grieve with him and are praying for him to be ministered to by the grace and peace of God. And you may ask every member of our team and they will tell you the same thing. We saw what God wanted us to see and what he's asking us to do and we were engaged in a spiritual assault. And so there are, there are two ways that we can respond to this. We can either say, well, if that is what's going to happen. If that is what the devil is liable to do, then it's not worth it. Partnership is not worth that. But Nikolai said partnership would require courage, and this is what God taught me. Courage means that day as that van lay on its ceiling. It's not that we need to have courage to stand up against spiritual opposition. No, that's that's not what it means, because here's the truth. We stand up against spiritual opposition all the time. We face it all the time. We're facing it right now. When the church of Jesus Christ gathers together in worship, we are standing against the gates of hell and saying, not in this city. The presence of God is here. We claim this ground for you, Jesus. That's what we face all the time. No, the courage that we require is this, the courage to continue to trust God as we go. That's, that's what we need. And this is the truth about what happened in the van that day. The presence and the protection and the healing power of God showed up. We were, every one of us, protected. We were, every one of us, preserved. There was not a single broken bone, and we watched the healing power of God at work in real time. He restored Bill and Luke and Jackie and Evo. He restored strength to Jamie's legs and strength to my neck and my back. God showed up, and our team walked through a fire together. And I couldn't love them more, be more proud of each one of them, because here's the thing. I wouldn't trade a single moment of our time there. 
I've never seen six people be more in tune to the needs of each other or work so courageously to trust the power of God to give them the strength to minister to each other, to get each other home. The six churches in that city collapsed in on us and prayed for us and cared for us. We saw the kingdom come on earth. That was Philippians church. That's what we saw. God showed up and the courage that is required of me and the courage that is required of you when we partner in the gospel is this, to trust God as we go. So as I close, I want you to think back on that word, partnership. We know that partnership requires something of everybody who's involved, but from a worldly perspective, it seems like partnership requires more of some than of others. And Paul, he mentions this in chapter 3. He says that, yes, some will experience even the joy of fellowshipping in Christ's sufferings. And when I think of those missionaries in Central Asia and how much they've given compared to what I've given, it seems like partnership requires more of some than others, but the gospel is the great equalizer. This is the last observation from from the text. God requires the same thing of us all. He requires our total commitment. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. We are to be all in, and that's going to look differently for each of us, but the commitment is the same. If you will commit your all to him, you will never regret it. In this letter, Paul knows he's nearing the end of his commitment, and he uses symbolic temple worship language. He says in chapter 217 that he's being poured out like a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of the faith of his partners in Philippi. This is a a reference to the conclusion of temple worship, the temple sacrifice ceremony when a goblet of wine was emptied out upon the burnt offering to symbolize being completely given, all in, every drop, total sacrifice and commitment. Let's stand and close our eyes and bow our heads. And as we stand, I, I want to tell you this. If you are not willing to commit your life to the gospel of Jesus Christ, I cannot guarantee you anything. But if you will give your all, if you will pour out your life as a living sacrifice, I can't tell you exactly what God will ask you to do or how he will lead you or where you'll go. But if you do, if you will join in this holy partnership, and devote yourself to the advancement of the gospel, being open to where God is moving, and have courage to trust God as you go, I guarantee that you will experience boundless joy available to you in every circumstance, and you will never regret your life. Jesus, I pray now for every heart in this room. God, there are those who have heard this message, have heard this call time and time again, but it's different this time. It's real this time. That, that they are being prompted to say, yes, I am all in. I will join in this holy partnership with you, Jesus, and with your church in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if that is you and you're praying that right now, as we worship, come forward and I'll meet with you and pray with you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
be seated. Thank you. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, it's good to be in your house today, and we give thanks that we can come together freely to worship your name, to be lifted up by the truth of your word and energized by the presence of our fellow believers. Father, our churchwide prayer focus this week is on reaching the lost. And so, God, we ask that you help us to be sensitive to those around us who do not yet know the truth and the freedom of your gospel. And give us direction to have a positive touch on their lives and point them towards Christ. Lord, now as we bring our tithes and offerings, we pray that they are brought to you in a spirit that is pleasing to you, Lord, and that in every way they will be used to glorify the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 